Hello, and welcome to Thinking Out Loud. I'm your co-host, Cameron McAllister. And I'm your co-host, Nathan Rittenhouse. You love hearing us talk about sports. You just can't <laughs> get enough of Nathan and Cameron talking about sports ball. So we're what we're going to say is tangentially, well, it's more than tangentially related to sports. I have in mind Harrison Butker's speech that went viral at a Catholic university. And he's also, it's interesting. So he's the, the kicker for the Kansas city chiefs. Same team. You may have as, heard of them. Right. You may have heard of them. Yeah. They've been in the news lately a little bit. One and of course, or same, or that's right. Same team as Tra- Travis Kelsey, who provides who's, a striking. Who's contrast. on the same team as Taylor Swift. <laughs> Correct. There you go. We completed the circle. (laughs) And a bunch of you got mad and winced when Nathan said that. Well, we do want to talk about this speech because it's interesting. As is as is the case these days, I think let's let me let me make three broad observations and then we'll launch into a discussion. Number one, there's absolutely on the on the face of it, there's absolutely nothing shocking, surprising, or even remotely controversial about anything in this speech. If you understand that this is a man, right? Well, if you understand that this is a a man who is a conservative Catholic speaking to Catholics at a conservative Catholic university. So everything he says is thoroughly consistent with that outlook. So there's that. Two, as would be expected, those on the left or people who are are of a progressive mindset were deeply offended and and angered by the speech. There's been an uproar there. Okay. So that's the second observation. And the third one is Christians, a number of theologically conservative evangelical Christians are also taking offense at some of the remarks in the speech Mm -hmm. for different reasons from their progressive neighbors, neighbors. So those are, th- and increasingly, Nathan, I'm finding that this is this is happening more and more when somebody gives voice to what I would broadly label sort of traditional statements or statements using any kind of normative language. Well, I'll I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. Mm-hmm. But those that's I think that's how we can we can open this. So you you've got, yeah, nothing he said is surprising. A lot of people are offended outside the church. A lot of people inside the church are offended as well. So I think we might need to parse why that's the case. Let's try to figure it out. Yeah, it's it's hard for me to like, so there's a little bit of an eye roll at ourselves here for talking about this, but I'll tell you why I think we need to do it. So back when this happened, what was a week ago? um, I saw a headline. I was like, eh. And then I saw another headline on another. And like, by the time I got the third or fourth one, I'm like, man, what did this guy say? So I went and read the speech. You can do it in like, six minutes I'd probably faster and then i was like oh that's funny like yeah same same analysis you had it's like this is a concern i mean the guy believes in traditional latin mass so that should right. be a that, like that you, took me off guard if you, <laughs> if you want to be like is he a conservative or not mm, traditional latin mass probably um so catholic speaking to catholics at a catholic college i was like what's the news story here and then here we are a week later and the thing just won't go away so that's why we're talking about it is because you've probably seen it now if you've looked at any news source in the last week. Um, and it's not just evangelicals, Cameron. Now there's a a statement from the Benedictine sisters who say that his statements don't represent um, the beliefs of Catholicism or the history of the college and that sort of thing. But it's what's funny oh, here wow. is that they're – well, let's say – so the controversy – the couple – there are numerous things people could be upset about. But one that, that's really gained the most traction – is that he said that one of the highest vocations or callings that a woman might want to pursue is that of a homemaker. And uh, I think, Cameron, you're the one who pointed out to me that Travis Kelsey did a commitment speech where he drank a beer during the speech. And then Mm -hmm. here you have Butker uh, saying you might want to be a a homemaker. And one of those two Mm -hmm. things is controversial. Welcome to the 2024. Um, But the the Benedictine sisters are saying, no, the highest calling is is to serve God, not to be homemaker which he didn't say it was the highest okay. it was one of the highest calling. but anyway so right all that to point out is then you have more the more progressive left so like npr runs a, 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 a thing saying the benedictine sisters did not approve of the speech well they didn't approve of it because i think also i mean he took a lot of shots at the catholic church 
Um, mm-hmm. When you're into traditional Latin mass, you're probably going to think there's some things that are a little wonky with the modern Catholic structure and system. Um, so I think they thought he was bringing disunity and that he wasn't taking seriously the call of the women who had devoted themselves to being nuns um, as a high vocation too. So anyway, why, basically, why don't we spell out some of anybody that, though, can be mad for about a second. it. Anybody can be mad about it. Go ahead. Yeah, we well, and so there's a similar dynamic here to what we talked about with the "He Gets Us" ad, where pretty much everybody was offended. But I want to mm-hmm. list some of those items just in case some of our listeners didn't, you know, read about the speech or watch it or listen to it. I listened to it because I wanted to catch his cadences. And, you know, it's interesting when he made those remarks about his wife and her being a homemaker. I don't know if it's if it's in the transcript, Nathan, but he gets emotional there. And so it's it's a very moving moment for him. And so that it's worth it's worth pointing that out, that this was this was a very what's what's unique about this speech. Also, among he wasn't standing on a dead body, thumping his chest when he said it is what you're saying. correct. Yes. I mean, and I've watched like many of us, I've watched a number of commencement addresses, this one, and he he makes a joke about this at the end, but this one is not padded with very much fluff. There aren't many jokes in there. It's, it's a fairly focused speech. And it's for that it's striking. And it's also memorable. But anyway, just just worth worth pointing that out. But he points to a number of hypocrisies in the Catholic Church right now. He makes statements like, well, he points to President Biden, for, for instance, making the sign of, a, of the cross at a pro-abortion rally and calls that delusional. I think, again, nothing even remotely surprising about a remark like that. And also, I would venture to say there's nothing even, there's nothing, I mean, there are, there are times where we need to make clear statements. Calling that divisive would be a bit like saying, I don't know, think of any other form of deeply damaging false doctrine or false ideas being smuggled into the church and somebody calling that out. You could say that's divisive or you could say, no, that's a necessary confrontation that needs to happen. It's kind of tragic that it's a lay person calling some of this stuff out. And indeed, he he points that out as well, because one of another item of his speech is that many church leaders are unwilling to deal with some of the key issues today because they're afraid of losing their constituency. Okay, that, that sounds familiar to probably, <laughs> oh, everybody who's everybody, in a theologically yeah. Cons- conservative yeah, <laughs> camp that nobody wants to be canceled. So people aren't being courageous. So he points that out. He points to the liberal drift in a lot of Catholics. Again, this guy attends Latin mass. There is nothing surprising about him doing so. But again, it, so those are items of controversy. But here I want to press into that. I used a word normative. So I've well, heard we some did a people. podcast on normal pho- normophobia not too long ago. Did. So that's, that's right. In the water here. Yes, it is. And so some some people... So these, these, these nuns would point out the highest vocation is to, you know, to give oneself to God or to serve God, surrender to him fully. I think that's well understood. And I think it's bad mm-hmm. faith to say that he's <laughs> arguing that all women universally should fulfill their highest calling of being solely and exclusively homemakers. He's not saying that, but within the context the of the speech. The last words of the speech is, were Christ is the king to the highest. Right. That's how the speech ends. He is. <laughs> I think he had. A, I think he, he has a pretty high Christology and concept of sovereignty in them. Absolutely. And w- if in the context of his remarks, though, here's what he is saying, though, and here's what I suspect is offending some people, and it's very telling that it is. He is saying, if I if I'm hearing him correctly, that a woman having being a wife and having children and raising those children is normative. Okay. Yeah. So. Let's deal with that for a second, because down the ages, nobody would have ever thought to question that. It's only in recent years, it's only really in modern times that we began to see those as expendable features of humanity. It's always been understood down the ages that that is the bedrock of civilization. And if you do away with that, you destroy a civilization, all of which he brings up, by the way. So I think we need to to sort of Think about that for a second. He's speaking in normative terms. Is he saying women can never be CEOs? No. Is he saying women have He's, no, th- that, is he saying singleness, single women don't matter? No. Is he saying that that is normative, what he's described, a woman taking care of children, raising them within the context of a marriage? He is. That's what I think is giving offense. 
the um yeah no he says to the women many of you will go on to have successful careers i mean it's yeah he's mm-hmm. he's not denig- he's not denigrating women working he's elevating those who choose to ha- have families and raise children um and he and he's not lining that out as mutually exclusive at all and also with the fact and why would he do th- and why would he do that because that the role of the the essential sacred okay, role well, so, of being a homemaker has been denigrated for a long well, time in I, our culture. I can give you numbers to point that out because there are now 215,000 signatures on a petition for him to be removed from the Kansas City Chiefs because he said that. So here's somebody mm-hmm. who's a, in a a Super Bowl champion who makes that comment that motherhood is significant and here come the guns. Think about the the women who aren't Super Bowl champions who are just mothers who like think that's a good use mm-hmm. of their time in their life. Um, mm-hmm. You, I mean, the, you can say, well, the, you know, the people aren't that down on motherhood and homemaking and that kind of thing. Yeah, well, listen to this speech. Why was it controversial? There you go. Right. So that's, that's very uh, revealing. Anyway, he, he touched a nerve, basically, is what happened. And so some of us, I think, to different degrees, are kind of naive to the degree to which this is a hot button topic. But let me let me let me uh, just throw this in the pot just for the fun of stirring things up here, Cameron. Um, mm hmm. It, this is and this is why, where it's really fun to have older friends and older family members. So, uh, you said it was normative throughout history for women to raise their children, right? Is that how you worded that? Right. Oh yes. Um, yep. There was there there was there wasn't there was an experiment that came along that said you know what it would be better if women didn't raise their children if we sent the women to work and then the state raised the children. Do you know what that system was called in public education systems? Do you know what that system was called? Mm-hmm. That was communism. What's up? That that was the right. that was the Soviet ideal for how yeah. families should be structured is that the women go to work and that the state through public education raises the children. And so this is funny when you talk to people who can remember this era mm-hmm. of like the late 40s and 50s when they said that the greatest fear in America is that the children would be shipped off to educational systems and the women would be sent to work in the corporations and the factories. And they, and that was the, the most un-American thing about the Russia, uh, the Soviet Union at the time was that was one of the, the principles that they had was to turn everybody into an economic unit and look for mm-hmm. the productivity solely in economic terms of every individual and what it can do for the state. So it's funny then, or sad, and you either laugh or cry, when you get around to here we are, whatever, 70 some years later, where we're saying, I can't believe that some women want to raise their children and not go into the office every day. So when you say what was normal, actually there has, there was a significant uh, system at play that proposed the antithesis of his ideals at least 70 years ago. So just Mm -hmm. throw, throw that bread on the water to see what bites it. But it's to me, there's a little bit of a irony in the back of that, that actually some of the things that we embody right now as the ideals of American liberal democracy actually got its foundation, not within Western liberal democratic ideals. And the point could be made then of like, well, this is the natural outworking, the regression of maybe a more progressive or liberal left leaning system is that it is just repackaged uh, Marxism Mm -hmm. in some sense. But let's just note that historically that those connections are actually there. I leave that that to the listener to figure out what the connection there really is and what it isn't. There's a historical anecdote to go along with it. Anecdote. Yeah, and another plug to read history because it's very eye-opening. There really is nothing new under the sun. I want to throw in and, another. And, and quick... for the record, my kids go to public school, and I don't think they're becoming communist. So just <laughs> don't hear that. As, as do mine. <laughs> yes. And so far, <laughs> they haven't. But, yeah, I, but so I, far, but I do think all, pushing okay. back. I, I think the helpful thing here is to push push back against the concept as a human, as a primarily an economic entity in unit. Yes, and I still important. my kids my kids go to public school as well, but their primary education is taking place in the household. And I suspect sure. Nathan would say roughly the same thing as well. And their main formation is happening here. So they go to school. I think a huge part of that is the social aspect and them learning boundaries with other people and learning how to get along with other human beings. And but be bilingual the form, and we're not true nature of chaos that's true that's true but we are certainly not outsourcing all of their education we have we already have many interesting discussions about some of the assumptions that show up 
in textbooks, homework assignments, and videos that were that were you know viewed at class. So we were we operate there with discernment as well. But I wanted to to point out also that the notion that so he doesn't mention singles. Okay, uh-huh. I just want to point out that this is a bit of a postmodern tick that all of us have these days, where we will we'll take a given article or speech or argument and we'll say, ah, it failed to mention this subject. It failed to mention this subject. So in this case, he's making some very specific remarks about his own life and his own journey with his now wife and how their relationship, you know, some of the dynamics of the relationship, the way she keeps him grounded, she keeps him from moving too far, you know, getting too carried away with his career and being, and she keeps him invested in his own family, his kids and all of that. So there's this tendency where we say, yes, but ha, what about, gotcha. What about the singles? You didn't mention anything about singleness. You, you seem to say that this is the only thing a woman can do. No, within the context of his speech, he has a very specific subject in mind right here. So just because he did not mention that you know somebody who's who's single you know what about all the single women who women who hear that and feel left out well clearly he's not speaking to all the single women in that what moment. about all the catholic and people that's okay who hear that and think he's not talking to us right i mean, I mean you like, don't yeah. <laughs> you don't address everyone everywhere all at once in anything that you say so the expectation that when you fail to mention some group you have this kind of gotcha moment I'm just pointing out and I'm submitting that for your for just just turn that over in your minds. It's worth thinking about that. That's a tick that we I've seen myself doing this to people before. Aha. But what about this? Well, I really wasn't talking about that, Cameron. Oh, you know what? Fair enough. That's true. (laughs) It's just it's a tick that we that I think a lot of us have inherited. And I think that's that's been a dynamic as I've seen this this speech as well. So I I think that's just a a habit of thought. Let me we should be bear in mind. Let me let me say where I think some of that comes from, because I find myself doing this, but it's really highlighted with if you ever do the stupid thing of starting to read comments under some of these, you know, online conversations. Don't do that. <laughs> pity the fool. Um, mm-hmm. But it is so, so clear that people have lost all ability to actually look at the words of what somebody said and decide what they mean. What we're actually doing is thinking what we think they meant and then trying to find their words to justify our mm. reaction against it. And so, I mean, even th- this this situation provides the ideal because as soon as I started seeing headlines about it, I'm like, I've got to go read the actual speech because oh yes, <laughs> none of these journalists are going to give it what what he was actually saying. Like, I just that's the sign of our time that I by default thought everybody's going to have an agenda or a slant on this. I just got to go read it for myself, and then to continue reading news articles after that, which clearly had the exact opposite of what he was implying in many of the things. You're just like, there's an inherent distrust here where everybody is taking kind of their, so all the gay people are going to look for reasons to be upset about it. All the single people are going to look for reasons to be upset about it. All the non-traditional ass, mm-hmm. Latin, Latin mass people are going to look for reasons to be upset. Like, you take what you're fired up about and then you go find something to fan the f- flame of your irritation, which is not reading and it's not engaging and it's not learning. It's you're just out gathering the Pokemon well, of your tribe for your if i can so so to me that's the frustration here is cameron is we're looking for data points to justify our own perspectives we're not actually trying to learn or understand somebody else's view yes if i may build on a little bit of what you're saying there in those instances it's more about your own self-expression than it is about what has actually taken place or what the person in question has actually said this is this is another byproduct of an age where basically the whole world is one big mystery science theater 3000 episode these days. <laughs> and I know that's a bit of a niche remark, but that was a show that aired on Comedy Central and then on the Sci Fi Channel for years. And I love it. Nathan's wife really loves it too. Oh, yeah. She and, can quote it to you. Yep. Oh, yeah. Well, but what it was was, and it was, it was light years ahead of its time and it didn't even realize it. it ta- the premise was you take these old B movies. And then you have silhouetted these three figures, two of them robots, one of them a person, just making cracks and smart aleck comments the whole way through the movie. It's a brilliant premise. 
But essentially, that that is our online world now, where we are. Everything's a comment section. We're all we're all making comments on everything, and it's all about you expressing yourself, give your opinion, even if you have no opinion on the matter. But you know, if you happen to be, belong to some you know particular group, you know where you can unite around a, a grievance, that's a spectacular opportunity to express yourself. Now, I realize that this runs the risk of sounding very cynical, but I do think it seems to be just a fact of our day where so much news becomes about, well, what do you think? What's your take? And, you know, how do you, how are you going to react to this? How's, what's your self-expression going to look like here? Which emoji are you going to go with here? That's also a dynamic of our age. Yeah. And it absolutely clouds things. <laughs> You're using it to find your people is what you're doing because yeah, you're using it because to find our your tribes are and, now dispersed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And send a message and, and just, you know, put your own stamp on it, you know, say your piece. But meanwhile, you know, what did the man actually say? What's, what's remarkable, Nathan, is if we just put it into very plain speech, this is going to sound hilarious. A famous athlete argues for the value of a traditional home and faith in God. That is what has happened. That is what he did. He didn't do anything more or anything less than that. And the whole world loses its mind. That's, that's a pretty revealing thing. <laughs> well, or, or we could say the whole world doesn't lose its mind. The online world loses its mind. Right. Um, no, that's fair. Very fair. Yep. And Okay, so here's the question I have as as you walk away from this, because you have the um, people saying, "Well, this is divisive," or mm -hmm, sure. you know this um, th this whole division thing. Like, this is not creating unity. Let me read you a little passage here from a book called Matthew, chapter ten. This is Jesus. Ever speaking. heard of it? Do not suppose. I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> ever heard of him? Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, mm. that's a, yep. kind of a weird passage just to throw in the middle of this. But... It's it's Jesus. Jesus's highest ideal was not unity. And so I, I guess what I'm wondering is for those in any as many of you will say, well, you know, in, in the high priestly prayer, he prays that we would be one. Yes. After we were found as one with the father. So um, mm -hmm. a common identity yeah. is the prerequisite for unity, not just unity for the sake of unity, but like creation. He separated the light from the dark at the end of all things. He separates the sheep from the goats. Jesus is kind of yeah. on a mission of like separating things out. So at what point, where, where, where have we lost the script as the church or where are the important boundary? Like, where can you just say like, Oh, you disagree with what I believe in? Yes. Because I believe in something very different than you. That's why you feel like there's a tension there. Cause I don't believe what you believe at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, at what point can you be like, um, yeah, somebody was chewing on me one time at a church I preached at, and they're like, well, that, that's a different gospel than I believe. And I'm like, yes, it is different than what you believe. I think this is what scripture says. Like, I, at what point can we just say, yeah, we don't agree here at all, and we have a totally different culture and a totally different way of life together, and we live in the one where we think that sometimes mothers like to raise their children. I well, know no, it's going to sound you. weird to you, but I mean, what's the... I'm with you on that because I think that there's a difference between unity and uniformity. <laughs> and I think we could we can tease that out a little bit as well. But when it comes to fundamental assumptions of the Christian faith, they are at profound odds with our cultural moment. And we have to be we, I think what Christians are learning now is that we have to be comfortable. We're, we're, what we're having to learn is how to now talk about that honestly and openly, like you were just saying. There was a time when it was possible to, I don't want to use the word soft pedal because that's, that's, that, that sounds negative, but it was possible to, you could say something along the lines of, let's set aside those differences for a second and just consider 
Jesus, you know, as, as a person, what do you think of him? Or you could, you know, for the sake of, 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 of the argument, let's bracket that for the time being. And there may be some times where you can still do that, but by and large, our ability to do that has come to an end because now those, mm-hmm. those, those are no longer secondary issues. They're sticking <laughs> the issues for a lot of, they're sticking points for a lot of people. And they're key points of, of cultural idolatry too. I mean, most of our cultural idols surround identity and sexual expression in particular. So we can't bracket yeah. that any longer. And also when people, as we've, a feature of the, as we've, you know, we've, we've adopted Aaron Wren's phrase, I think it's helpful, negative world. A feature of the negative world is that if you part ways with people on those assumptions, they don't, they often will not just view you as being misguided or wrong. They will see you as a bad person, part of the problem, the wrong side of history, you know, on and on we could go. Well, we have to be willing or, to. Or you run into a situation where you can't really invite someone into another way of living life as a Christian if they don't think your life is actually different. So there's almost this, this necessary, um, what do I want to, I, I want to be careful how I word this because there's a lot of room for confusion here. But unless the church is actually a different way of living, then the church can't invite anybody else into its new way of living. Does that make sense? Yes. Like there, there has to be a, a comparison oh, yes. and a contrast here of saying like, what? Yeah, anyway. So look, my friend, in my, I, my like, friend what's the hang up? What is, what is my, what is my hang up here with just embracing the, um, I'm not advocating for going full on Amish here. Like, Oh, you still speak English. You heathen. Um, no, you're getting at, but something there does have to become because, a, a distinction without isolation. No, there does because yeah. And I like that phrase that you and Aaron have adopted there. I'm going to quote my friend, Jonathan Welch here and say that the church often has failed to be an alternative to the culture. And right, yeah. In the past, in calls the neutral world where Christianity the juries out, and you know, it, people are open to persuasion. There was a danger to slide into too. You, you you had basically too much accommodation, and the church did end up looking more and more like the culture in an effort, in a kind of outreach effort. You know, hey, we're gonna, you know, we're not, we're not weird. In some ways, we're just like you. There are no, actually, we're not. We are weird. We're we are part of the marching band, and we have to be upfront about that in in a spirit of intellectual honesty and just truth. But I, this Nathan is why. So here's here's the weird part of this. Yeah. Yeah, So here's the weird part of this. You you know what demographic is the most likely to be stay at home moms? What's that? Like super wealthy urban liberal elites, right? (laughs) Because they can afford. I mean, there are a lot of people who like. Because they can afford to be. Yeah. Everybody that I know who's a stay at home mom is a very well educated, very mm-hmm. thoughtful, hardworking, right. like does a phenomenal amount. It's not like they're like chained to the oven in the kitchen. I mean, wherever that mm-hmm. stereotype came from. Sure. They're out in the community, in the libraries, in the school, in the programming, in the community and running. Like it is a go, 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 full on entire full life. Right. Um, but Nathan, you know, I. By people who, who had the intellectual capacity to, to choose it and feel like they have the economic freedom to be able to do it. So it's, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just weird. It's like it's almost mocked by the people who embrace it. In some okay, but the, the reaction that bothers me the most here, the one that does not bother me is the reaction from the wider culture because that's what I would expect. People outside the church don't like the way life inside the church happens. That makes perfect sense. And my hope, of course, is to persuade hearts and minds, but, you know, with God, by God's grace and, you know, obviously rel- with reliance on the Holy Spirit. but. The part that bothers me, Nathan, is is that a lot a lot of theologically conservative Christians now get up in arms about this, and that's where I think, okay, but why? Oh, hang on, yeah, F- help me out here on this one because you you said that at the beginning and we didn't flesh that out. That even with the, among conservative evangelicals, there's some pushback on mm-hmm. Bucker's speech. Yes, what was the oh the specific the nature of that? I mean, the real thrust of it has to do with the way his well his remarks on on women and because i mean he does there's that whole part of the speech where he says you know women i'm speaking to you now he has a whole another speech part of the speech mm. to men as well and you know as a side note the ice on my heart on the subject of biblical manhood is starting to thaw a little bit not because i i think it's in the bible there's nothing on biblical manhood per se in the bible but because i think there is so much confusion on the subject of masculinity now because it is so denigrated in our society 
that I think it probably is mm-hmm. necessary right. to yes. have more talks about it. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. starting to come around to that. But back to the women, he makes, he makes a number of remarks to the women. And so the reactions I've seen from some theologically conservative, thoughtful Christians have been, yeah, basically you're giving a very low ceiling for women that tells them that they're not valuable unless they're mothers and unless they're homemakers. But some of us don't feel called to be moms. Okay. That's a whole nother, that's, that's another issue. And some of us are single. Okay. Fair. But again, back to my remarks earlier, he's not, he's not denigrating single women. He's not, and certainly he's, again, he's a conservative Catholic. He would be all in favor of nuns and women who have devoted their entire lives to, some, to a monastic order or, you know, to the service of, of Christ. Certainly he would see that as venerable and wonderful. Right. Yeah. You know, so, but I, what bothers me is I, what, what? yeah. So that, that's, that's what I'm hearing. What bothers me, Nathan, go- is I'm, I'm sensing a little bit of a disingenuous note here because if you really press Christians on this, conservative Christians, nothing of what he said is untrue or unhelpful. I'm sensing they just don't like the way that this is affecting those outside the church, and they don't want to be painted with that same brush. And that's a little bit more of the old, yeah. I'm not like those other Christians. I, we, we're going to have to get over that. Because guess what? If you're a Christian, you are. You are. And you're, you're not going to look, I mean, if you want to, and I know, I'm just, I'm just going to go ahead and say it and put my cards on the table and people can you know, push back. We'll have a, dis- we're going to have a forum, a discussion forum soon with thinking out loud where people can, you know, take these ideas to task. But I do think that a lot of Christians still have a vision where they, they want a, a better seat at the cultural table and they want to be seen in a certain light. And so they find, they find issues like this uncomfortable because they want to be seen in a certain light and this paints them in a bad light. I think we have to get be comfortable being ostracized and standing out. So what, what what you're saying here, I think one of the repeated themes that you're bringing out, Cameron, is to say is to is to affirm the goodness of something is not to say that everything that isn't that is bad. Yeah. So so it's it's, it's almost like this is a logical outworking of a totally you know divided, fractured culture where if you say you know what it is a good thing to for somebody to be a mother. That does not mm-hmm. mean that you think a woman who decides to have a full time career is bad. You're Correct. just saying it's a good thing to be a mother. So, so we we almost automatically go into the opposite mode of mm-hmm. like, well, then this goes back to what you said. But it's the what about is yeah. Jesus? Mm-hmm. It's the what about is yeah. But Jesus radically pro single people was himself single. The apostle yes. Paul, the whole New Testament scripture about like a high a high calling, yep. um, and throughout the history of the Christian faith and church the concept of being uh, single and celibate for the sake of the kingdom is highly, is the most highly venerated position. Yes. Think um, about Paul's and remarks along on the, the way, subject. Jesus, Je- yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I'm saying to, to throw a bone to the mothers every once in a while is, is not denying the fabric of the new Testament. It's just saying, Hey, and this Jesus went to a wedding once he, he valued this he, he's pro children. Um, so how, how is it that we just want to in, yeah, encourage a, a small su- subset of something without uh, trashing mm-hmm. everything else is suddenly awkward. Yeah. So let's not, I think I'm always learning as I'm doing this of like, well, look how the culture is responding to this. And then I want to spool it back in my own mind and say, okay, where am I tempted to misread what somebody actually yeah. said That's to good. spin yeah. it into my own um, way of validating my own beliefs? Um, am I automatically assuming that they're anti everything that they haven't affirmed? Um, and so there's, mm-hmm. there's some good educational moments in here, but I do think I'm with you that there will have to be more and more when we're like, yeah, we're different. Yep. That's and now where do we go from here? Um, cause that, that's where the Christ conversation is calling his people to be different. Yeah. That's where the conversation needs to be go needs to go. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We have deep differences. Yes. I well, And, and again, just as a word of encouragement in the online world, these things don't go so well. People don't respond well person to person. Yeah. I'm finding Nathan's found you've probably found it. It's not quite so hostile. People respond differently when you're face to face. Well, which world do you live in? That's the question. Like, yeah, yeah that's another one of the great divides. The online world versus the real world. Cho- the real choose world. one. Yeah. Um, and that you're going to get your ethics and your concept. Of what's yes. Real. And I've, I mean, I have many of our friends are not Christians and 
they would hold to i mean they move with the default settings of the of cultural orthodoxy as, as i called it as i call it and they but when these when these items come up i'm open and honest and they have not disowned me <laughs> they'll will agree to disagree on certain certain items but they they also know me they know i care about them they know i'm not a hateful person now it's true sometimes they people will still say well no i think you're a hateful bigoted person and we okay so be it you're going to think that <laughs> Some, sometimes people are going to think that i right. mean but, but yeah so, so i think I think we're trying to model this well here, though, even in this context, because Cameron, neither one, neither of us are Catholic or right. even close to it. And <laughs> we're certainly right. not going to traditional Latin mass. Um, right. And we have a whole lot of other things we yep. can talk about if you want to get into um, some of the finer details mm -hmm. and nuance. To, but that doesn't mean that we don't believe that people who are Catholic have some legitimate faith and can make some seriously wonderful points that we can cheer for. So it's, I, I don't know. Yep. On, one, on one hand, there is a, separation of like this is different from this on the other hand there are still lots of things that we can look at and say yeah i'm i agree with that i mm -hmm. yeah three cheers for the moms of the world so well yeah, i hope that's um, one one other funny thing i just want to throw in here before you wrap this up for us cameron is mm -hmm. i did see um back whenever the the pro-palestinian protest on campuses were, were more uh you know it's like do they send in the police do they not I did mm. see some online voices saying, you know, really what they ought to do to clear up the protest is to send in the nuns. Mm. Give oh, the nuns some yeah. yardsticks and let them loose. Uh, yeah, we, can, yeah. we can organize these uh, <laughs> these uh, higher educational <laughs> structures if mm -hmm. we just turn some nuns loose on the world. So um, I got a good chuckle out of that, clearly from some people who maybe had had their knuckles wrapped as a young person. But anyway, three cheers for the mothers of the world, I say. Three cheers for the mothers of this world. Amen. Well, we have, there's more to be said on this subject. It'll be interesting to, to see as this conversation develops and to see Harrison's, you know, Butker's career as it develops. At first, I'll confess, when I first heard about this, I thought, is this, I mean, I, and I see this, this good looking football player, you know, being championed by certain conservative Christians and, and, you know, yelled at by others. And, and I thought, oh, is this our next Tim Tebow? And he's not. This guy's this guy's different. It'll be interesting to to keep our eyes on him. But we hope that this conversation has has brought more light than heat, and we hope it's gotten the wheels turning. So thank you for for listening in. And Go thanks. listen to the speech if you have it and you're concerned definitely. about it. Yeah, definitely. I, I would say in better even than reading it is to is to watch it just to to see him and his and his body language. He's a he's he's a very he's a very compelling speaker, and so yeah. Definitely. But yeah, you've been listening to Thinking Out Loud, a podcast where we think out loud about current events and Christian hope. Thanks for listening to Thinking Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about what we do, book Nathan or Cameron, or if you'd like to support us financially, whether through a one-time donation or on a monthly basis, you can do so on the donate page at www.toltogether.com. That's toltogether.com. And please consider leaving us a five-star rating and sharing this content with your friends. It really does help.